uh, wait uh, for the participants to, to kind of load in before we get started. See people start to rolling in. I think that you can start. It's already eight minutes after the hour. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Dushante Carmen from the Institute of Cannabis Research, and welcome to the April Cannabis Cultivation Webinar. We will be starting shortly, but first, we we'll allow a brief moment for attendees to join the webinar, which is happening now. All right. And it seems the number of attendees has increased and stabilized, so I can begin now. Hello. Once again, my name is Dushante Carmen. I am the grants manager and program officer at the Institute. Of cannabis research, and I am filling in for Dr. Sang Park today as the chair of the webinar series. Um, and then we have, um, you want to introduce yourself, Dr. Bernstein? Oh, hi, my name is Dr. Andrei, Professor Andrei Bernstein. I'm from Volcani Institute, and we're co chairing this webinar series, which is a, a organized uh, jointly between the Institute of Cannabis Research and Volcani Center in Israel. Excellent. Before we begin our presentation, I'd like to inform you that the ICR will be hosting the ICR Cannabis Research Conference in Denver, Colorado from August 3rd to August 5th. If you're interested in participating, please visit the conference homepage or contact ICR directly, and we'll be happy to provide you with more information. Also, I would like to provide some information regarding the logistics of the webinar. Today's presentation will be followed by a short question and answer period. To ask a question, please use the question and answer feature in the Zoom to toolbar. You can enter the questions at any time during the presentation and we'll address as many questions as time allows until the end of the hour. Please do not use the chat function to post questions for the question and answer period. Instead, please reserve the chat function for technical issues and questions. Both the question and answer and chat functions can be found in the toolbar on your Zoom screen. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. 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 <laughs> <laughs> uh, who, you know, we're we're going to talk about our, our host today, Dr. James DeDecker. Um, this gentleman has a very great presentation for us today. Uh, Dr. DeDecker, do you want to introduce yourself and Tell us a little about this. I'll, in, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Dudecker. Okay. So first of all, it's a great honor to have you here. Uh, Dr. Dudecker is the director of Michigan State University Upper Peninsula Research and Extension Center in Chatham, Michigan. And he's a specialist in the MSU Extension Community Food and Environment, uh, Environment Institute. Dr. Dudecker has led hemp research at MSU since nine, 2019 with a focus on agronomy, variety performance, and integrated pest management for all hemp products. Together with the university collaborators and growers from Michigan, from Wisconsin, from Illinois, from Indiana, Dr. Decker facilitated the Midwest Hemp Research um, Collaborative, which is currently focused on launching a new participatory research project supported by USDA NIFA. James also served as the Michigan representative for the multi-state S 1084 Hatch Project, which is focused on collaborative hemp research efforts across the U.S. And I'm very excited that you accepted our invitation and agreed to come and present to us and tell us, you know, about the experimentation and the results that you are con uh, conducting, which I think have a very large value, not only to the area that you are working with, but apparently, you know, to the U.S. and to the entire world. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here. It's a great honor to be able to speak to a wider audience outside of our uh, Midwest region here in the U.S. And um, I will go ahead and share my screen and get started with the presentation.
Okay. Um, so the uh, talk was advertised as uh, just agronomy and variety performance, but I thought I'd throw a little bit of pest management information in there um, because it has been an interesting part of our work as well. So um, that'll be a, a little bit of a late ad. A quick overview of the presentation today, I'm going to give a very brief introduction in terms of uh, hemp definitions and uses. I'm not totally uh, knowing what the audience would be like today. Um, when I was putting the talk together, I wanted to make sure that everybody starts in the same place, uh, understanding how hemp differs from other cannabis. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the background of hemp in the Midwest US and how we got where we are today in terms of the, the research and the commercial production that's happening here in the region. Um, then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the different projects, uh, partners, and funding agencies that we're uh, engaged with around this subject of hemp. And then we'll get into some of the meat of our research in terms of agronomy, pest management, and variety performance. And then we'll have time for questions. So I'm guessing that most people are familiar with what hemp is, but so that everybody is clear, uh, hemp is uh, legally defined right, rather than biologically defined in the sense that it is cannabis, uh, just like marijuana, except uh, the difference is that in the United States, uh, hemp has been defined as cannabis with less than 0.3% THC. It is uh, like other cannabis, an annual broadleaf plant. Um, it was legalized nationwide uh, through the 2014 and 2018 farm bills in the United States. So the 2014 farm bill permitted research uh, by state departments of agriculture culture and institutes of higher education, the 2018 Farm Bill legalized commercial production of hemp in the United States. And today we find ourselves uh, in a situation where hemp is regulated at the state or tribal level uh, under U the USDA final rule and approved plans that states or tribes uh, submit to the USDA uh, outlining how they're going to regulate uh, according to the final rule. Uh, hemp is really uh, designed to derive three primary products, and that is the fiber from the stem, the grain or the seed itself, uh, which is an oil seed, uh, high levels of oil and protein in the seed, um, and then the, of course, the cannabinoids from the flowers themselves. Um, this also is a breakdown really in terms of the different genetic pools that we're drawing on. So we usually have distinct cultivars for these different purposes or products. And then also that feeds into the production systems in terms of how we produce this crop. <clears throat> This is a great uh, figure that uh, many of you may be familiar with that just kind of looks at all the different uses of hemp uh, and the different portions of the plant. Um, you hear interesting statements about uh, hemp products and hemp utilizations. You know, there's there's 10,000 uses of hemp. There's 25,000 uses of hemp. Well, you know, hemp is essentially a plant biomass. It does uh, have many potential uh, utilizations and products. Um, but, but the conversation reminds me a lot of the bioenergy conversations maybe a decade or so ago in the United States that have recently been reinvigorated, uh, but were waning for a while. And in the sense that there's a million things that we can do with this plant, uh, but the real question is what is uh, the best use of the, of the plant materials that are, we're driving from hemp? And then what is uh, sort of technologically and economically feasible and efficient to accomplish uh, with this plant. In terms of the history of hemp cultivation in the United States and specifically in the Midwest US, um, we really have a long history, but it's been um, uh, divided by many gaps of declining production. And then of course, the biggest gap that we had of prohibition. Um, and what's interesting is hemp cultivation is kind of uh, peaked in the United States during times, usually warfare, uh, Civil War, World War I, World War II, where our access to other sources of plant-based fibers, other natural fibers were uh, somehow curtailed, usually by, by conflict. Um, this figure that you see here is from 1918. So this is really illustrating kind of the status of the hemp industry around uh, World War I. And uh, you can see that aside from Kentucky, the state of Kentucky, really the Midwest US was the center of uh, hemp cultivation at that time in the United States. And so it really is uh, 
exciting to kind of reinvigorate, reinvent this industry um, in our region and take advantage of the opportunities that were leveraged uh, at that time in the 19 teens, again in the 1940s during World War II. And this picture on the left actually is uh, a picture from very near where I'm located in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Uh, and it's titled Richard's Hemp Farm. And uh, that was some hemp cultivation that was happening in the 1920s around Saney, Michigan. So we do have that history to draw on, which is exciting. But but prohibition pretty much dismantled the entire industry and the knowledge base that we have to work from. So that's been a challenge. Um, I don't go into the details of all these regulations, uh, but just want to use this opportunity to kind of point out the timeline for how uh, hemp research and uh, commercial production has evolved here in the Midwest US. Um, so in 2014, we had the farm bill that authorized hemp research. Some states in the US uh, took advantage of that and got started with research quite early. So Colorado, Kentucky uh, were some examples of that. Um, however, it actually took the legalization of marijuana in Michigan in 2018 to really start the conversation and start uh, hemp cultivation in, in Michigan. Um, so it wasn't until 2019 that we initiated our research at Michigan State University. Um, and then since that time, uh, we have uh, the Michigan Department of Agriculture and Rural Development has uh, developed an approved hemp regulation plan. So here in Michigan, we are functioning under that plan now, uh, complying with the final rule and uh, with oversight from the Department of Agriculture in the state. And if you look across the region, the 12 states of the Midwest US, we have 10 similar state level or state managed programs. We also do have two states um, that have reverted to USDA managed programs and Wisconsin is, is one of those. So that's been interesting to learn from their experience of what it's like to be regulated directly by USDA rather than the states. And Michigan is actually considering uh, going that direction as well. We'll see what the future holds. Um, the next few slides describe <clears throat> the projects that we have and the partners and the funding agencies affiliated with those. So um, the first project that we started here um, on, a, on a larger scale was what we call the Hemp Tribal Research Initiative for Michigan. Uh, this is funded by the NIFA Tribal Colleges Research Grant Program, and it was a partnership of Michigan Tribal Colleges, Farms, Michigan State University, and Lake Superior State University uh, here in Michigan. And our objectives were really to uh, conduct a variety of evaluations for all the different types of hemp CBD grain and fiber, do some pest monitoring. We did a weed management system study uh, that I'll share a little bit later. And then focusing on tribal needs assessment and outreach. If anyone's familiar with uh, tribal communities in the US, um, there's been a lot of interest in cannabis, both marijuana and hemp. Um, as a tool for um, economic development, as a tool for uh, sovereignty in terms of uh, food, medicine, and other materials. Um, and it's been very interesting to see how those relationships have developed between tribes and universities, tribes in the private sector, and so forth around cannabis. And so we're trying to uh, bring some data and experience and build research capacity at these tribal institutions along the way. Uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, I'm also uh, serving as a representative currently for the uh, Hatch Multi-State Project for Hemp, the S1084 project. My colleague Kurt Thalen uh, at MSU is a previous representative and he's uh, moved on to other things. Um, this is a large project with 72 researchers representing 29 different states and uh, universities, as well as uh, representatives of USDA directly. And uh, we're broken into five working groups. And as you can see there, um, I am... Uh, uh, primarily focus on the agronomy and sustainability working group. Uh, this project had their first five years uh, and now we just submitted a proposal for a renewal or, or a new funding and, uh, and uh, opportunities to continue the work that we're doing. So we're excited to, to move forward with the next five years. Um, when you look at these projects, the Hemp Trim Project, S1084, and where that work has occurred in Michigan, um, this is kind of a map of those locations. So you can see uh, I'm located, uh, the northernmost Sparty helmet here in the Central Upper Peninsula is our facility, the UP Research and Extension Center. Um, we've conducted work at our sister station at Hyde, Michigan, uh, Bay Mills Community College in the Eastern UP, Zeba Mijuang Farm, Little Traverse Bay Bands, uh, Wadawa Indians uh, in the Northern Lower Peninsula, Saginaw Chippewa Tribal College in the central lower peninsula and then campus there in East Lansing as well. Um, 
Another program that we, or a project that we have active right now supported through the SARE Partnership Grant Program is what we call the Hemp Cultivar Check Program. This is managed by Phil Alberti, now at University of Wisconsin. It is a four-state partnership, like a lot of the work that we're doing in hemp recently. Um, and this is focused on participatory on-farm CBD trials to try to identify good potential, or what we call good potential cultivars for the Midwest. So we've developed criteria um, and, and common methods for engaging growers in this participatory research. And in 2022, we had 32 growers evaluating 20 different cultivars across the region. And I'll talk a little bit more about the hemp database, which is the main repository of our variety testing uh, results, uh, both from growers and from the universities uh, that are collaborating on this project and others. Um, but the cultivar check program is really kind of this feedback loop where we're taking material that performed well at university trials, bringing it out on farms and kind of validating that with grower input um, and, and grower generated data and samples as well. Uh, they submit floral samples at different time points uh, that we'll look at later. And it's been a great way to kind of narrow that list quickly because if you're familiar with, uh, with hemp genetics and um, how rapidly the space has evolved, the seed suppliers, the varieties are changing year over year very quickly. Uh, in some cases, a supplier we had last year is no longer business this year, or the varieties have changed uh, entirely. And so it's been really important for us to keep up with where the genetics are headed and provide this data back to growers so they can make some informed decisions, particularly because of the regulatory risk uh, in high cannabinoid hemp of, of going over that THC threshold. This is a map of, of where growers are located for the cultivar check program in 21 and 22. So you can kind of see the distribution of our work there. Our newest project is the Midwest Hemp Research Collaborative, and this is also a NIFA-funded project under the Supplemental and Alternative Crops Program. Uh, again, a partnership of the four states uh, that I mentioned earlier. And uh, similar to the Cultivar Check Program, we are using this sort of mother and baby model of university trials that are replicated on farm uh, in simpler designs with fewer numbers of treatments. And uh, the growers also focus on collecting more kind of qualitative observations uh, that pairs very nicely to kind of support and validate the quantitative information that we're collecting at the universities. Um, the other thing, aside from variety trials that we're doing in the uh, Hemp Research Collaborative Project, is we're doing a lot of agronomy work as well, looking at soil prep, planting, nitrogen fertility, um, and trying to sort out some of those agronomic questions for growers. And then again, all that data is being fed into the Midwestern Hemp Database uh, that I'll describe a little bit more in detail. Um, this is the, the some of the locations for the uh, participants this year in the Hemp Research Collaborative. Um, we've got 15 growers engaged in the trials this year. Um, and a really cool tool, if you're interested in learning more about how to execute on-farm research efficiently, is uh, Seed Linked. Seed Linked was actually developed more on the vegetable side, but they've been adapting it for other types of crops like hemp. And it's an awesome online platform that you can use and an app, a, a mobile app as well, uh, that you can use to engage farmers in on-farm research. Research. So I would highly encourage you to check out Seedlink. They've got great tutorials and introductory videos and things that you can learn more on your own. So uh, now we'll talk a little bit about agronomy, uh, some of the recommendations that we're making and the work that we're doing in this area. So um, in general, we found that the Midwest conditions in the Midwest are conducive uh, for hemp cultivation. That includes Michigan as well, even as far north as we are in the Upper Peninsula. We kind of wondered uh, what that would look like, but we've had quite a bit of success. Um, across soil types as well, the advantage of our dispersed research network, including both universities and commercial growers is that we're challenging these hemp cultivars across a wide range of environments, both, you know, uh, latitudinally, uh, but also in terms of uh, soil conditions. In the Midwest, we're planting uh, direct seeding hemp around the same time uh, that we're planting corn. So usually uh, in the southern part of the Midwest, that would be like the first two weeks of May and the northern portions of the Midwest, that would be about the second two weeks of May is when we're planting. 
In terms of uh, soil health and fertility, um, we are getting deeper into this subject uh, in the next three years, conducting some nitrogen rate trials uh, for grain and fiber. But based on information from other sources, uh, we found that um, although uh, you may uh, see response to higher nitrogen rates, uh, certainly there is a balance point for efficiency there, and also uh, issues with fiber in terms of quality. So uh, generally looking at lower nitrogen recommendations uh, for fiber able to uh, attain certain quality specs with that. Um, there's a lot of work happening outside of our region in terms of uh, hemp fertility and hemp nutrient removal um, and nutrient uh, sufficiency and deficiency levels. Um, we haven't gotten very far into that in our region. And so we're still in many cases making recommendations with proxy crops like wheat. Uh, so if somebody submits a soil test, you know, there's not a hemp code for most of the labs in the Midwest. And so they're using wheat as a proxy for P and K in particular. Um, in, in terms of soil health and fertility, I think an important point to make um, is related to carbon sequestration. We hear a lot about how cannabis or hemp can benefit soils. And to be honest, uh, I don't know that I've seen a lot of evidence for that. Um, certainly diversifying our crop rotations can benefit um, uh, our soils, but uh, I think there's a lot of potential for carbon sequestration in the hemp biomass itself. So if we're harvesting hemp fiber and putting that in a stable product like hempcrete, for example, that seems like a great way to potentially sequester carbon. I'm actually concerned that in a hemp fiber system where we're trying to maximize biomass and sequestration in that biomass, that we may actually draw down uh, soil carbon because we're removing all of that residue. And also, uh, as I'll talk about in a minute, uh, hemp really uh, benefits from tillage for seedbed preparation. Um, and so I think it's going to be difficult to try to maximize um, biomass yields for carbon sequestration while also maintaining soil health and fertility. So uh, we're excited to dig more into that subject. And I know um, there's a climate smart uh, agriculture, climate smart commodities proposal led by Florida um, that has been funded and they're looking specifically at carbon cycling and hemp. So that'll be exciting to, to learn from. Um, in terms of site preparation, again, uh, we're generally seeing that tillage is required. Uh, we're also um, looking a lot at not just tillage itself, but soil finishing, uh, packing or firming, and how we improve stand establishment. Stand establishment has actually been one of the greatest challenges that we've seen uh, with direct seeded grain and fiber hemp. Um, at times, we've been seeing like 50% uh, stand loss or 50% mortality. Um, and so uh, it seems to be a fairly weak seedling, uh, probably uh, prone to soil-borne pathogens. Um, and we're also um, uh, finding a pretty uneven emergence, so a lot of late emerging plants. Um, so thinking about how we improve stand establishment, um, well, not, of course, uh, overdoing it on tillage or uh, degrading soil health in the process, but thus far um, we have been reliant on tillage to get good stand establishment and direct seeded hemp. Um, in terms of, of seeding rates, in general, we're shooting for about 25 plants per square foot on fiber, 15 plants per square foot on grain. Um, but uh, we are looking at that mortality factor of you know 30 to 50 percent, uh, which can be very difficult to uh, deal with in terms of seed cost and uh, predicting how how many seeds are actually going to turn into plants. Um, but uh, the other issue with with establishment and seeding rates is that. Uh, the varieties that we've been working with, seed quality has been all over the board. Um, and that's in reference to seed size, uh, has been highly variable in the in the hemp material that we've worked with. Also, um, uh, seed germ and vigor has not been great. Uh, it seems to be improving as we go through the years, um, but uh, but certainly we're still receiving material that uh, is, is pretty low quality. Um, again, you know, the suppliers are constantly evolving. Uh, so some of them are, are growing quite quickly and doing a nice job. Others of them, I think, are still struggling to produce quality seed um, for the growers in our uh, part of the country here. Uh, cannabinoid production, if you're not familiar, looks usually quite a bit different. So we're usually talking about all female plants growing from cuttings, transplants, or feminized seed, uh, growing in beds in a more horticultural model, widely spaced. Um, 
Now, we'll say this is evolving too. We have uh, suppliers uh, and growers that are looking at more of a broad acre model for CBD cultivation. Um, and for example, using uh, day neutral or auto flowering plants direct seeded in more of a field crop model and then using forage type equipment to harvest that biomass in an efficient manner. Um, so uh, I think that the horticultural model probably will wane as we uh, both kind of leverage the broad acre acre model and develop those technologies and, and genetics simultaneously, but also look at things like uh, multi-purpose crops and can we capture cannabinoids from uh, hemp that is primarily designed for uh, grain and fiber production. And then in terms of uh, harvest, uh, you know, we're usually uh, mowing, windrowing, uh, hemp fiber, leaving it in the field for dew redding has uh, been the standard approach here in the Midwest. Um, now, we are kind of curious about this. Um, so sometimes, uh, you know, redding usually goes fine, but then getting the material dry enough uh, can be a challenge in our fairly temperate uh, climate. And so we're interested in other alternatives, maybe leaving hemp on the ground in the field till spring or other types of modified approaches to redding, be that, you know, water redding or some kind of chemical or mechanical redding. I've even heard growers talking about, you know, can we ensile uh, hemp fiber in some way or put it into silage bags or or a similar type of system um, to deal with with moisture issues or, or processing or pre-processing. So um, this is something that we're still working out. And then in terms of grain harvest, um, this is an indeterminate flowering plant, uh, so we're never going to have you know, full seed maturity. Um, so we're targeting about 60, 60 to 70 percent maturity for harvest. Um, that has a grain at about 22 to 30 percent moisture. There's still going to be some green in the plants. Uh, if you wait too long, you'll either have uh, shattering, you will have uh, pre-harvest sprouting. We've seen quite a bit in the field uh, for varieties that are earlier maturing in our trials and maybe don't get harvested uh, until a little bit later. We have seen quite a bit of pre-harvest sprout. The other issue is bird damage in grain hemp. Um, that is a significant problem almost every year in our region if you don't harvest in a timely manner. Uh, there are some combine modifications that are recommended, but in general, uh, you know, normal uh, combines designed for small grains um, or soybeans uh, can, can function in a hemp system. And then post-harvest handling is really critical in terms of drying and cleaning because it is a seed with high oil content. There's usually a decent amount of moisture in it at harvest, and you have that green immature seed in the mix as well, which can really uh, cause the seed or the grain to degrade quite quickly if it's not handled properly. Uh, CBD hemp is harvested at peak flowering. Usually uh, harvest dates are determined by THC levels or CBD and THC levels. And it's really critical to use that tool and be regularly testing to plan your harvest. Um, in uh, the US, we have a 30 day window from uh, testing mandated testing uh, for THC compliance and harvest. Um, that window gives growers flexibility, which is nice. Um, it is also a little bit ironic in that in general, uh, if a plant, you know, say you're testing at three weeks post flower uh, for your compliance and then you're not harvesting for another month, in many cases, uh, the plants are actually going over the THC threshold by the time they're harvested, um, which is an uh, interesting wrinkle in terms of the, the regulation and, and also how the post harvest products are, are regulated. Um, a lot of people are still hand harvesting whole plants, uh, drying them with hanging them in barns, as you see here. Um, but again, more mechanized broad acre systems are, are in the works and are being tested uh, here in the U.S. and in the Midwest. Uh, this is a figure that my colleague put together uh, looking at the data from the cultivar check program. And this is a CBD timeline, uh, kind of histogram of CBD uh, transplanting, flowering dates, and harvest in the Midwest. So you can kind of see what our year looks like here. Um, now, in general, uh, for CBD, we're transplanting. So we're seeding the greenhouse a month or so before transplanting. Uh, then we'll transplant the plants. You can see how flowering is, is functioning here. Um, 
as a as a function of our day length. So really about it's about August 15th where we see uh, the uh, day and night length tip over uh, to the point where we're triggering flowering in most cultivars. And then uh, harvest is happening kind of uh, early October, early to mid-October. Um, I will say that on the cannabinoid side, a lot of the genetics have been too late for the upper Midwest. Um, so that has been a challenge. Now, uh, if they're immature, they're probably also compliant, but the CBD or other cannabinoid concentrations are also lower. Um, so that has been a challenge, finding varieties that are early enough for the upper Midwest. Um, and then uh, in terms of grain and fiber timeline, um, the planting dates, again, would be more uh, May timeline uh, for direct seeding. But the flowering uh, um, is, is somewhat similar. We do have some quite early grain varieties out of Canada that will flower uh, in uh, mid-July, as you see here. And then um, harvest is usually a little bit earlier than uh, most of the cannabinoid varieties. Okay, moving on to uh, talk about pest management. So um, early on, we didn't see a lot of insect pest issues in uh, hemp in the Midwest. And that's mostly the assumption is that there just weren't a lot of acres of hemp out there. And so the pest load was fairly limited. However, as we move forward, more and more insects are becoming uh, apparent and abundant in uh, hemp crops. And and it's a wide range of insects that we find in hemp in the Midwest, uh, defoliators, borers, uh, sucking pests. Um, however, we have lots of beneficial, excuse me, and incidental insects that are, are making their home in hemp as well. And so it's nice to think that uh, adding this diversity to our cropping systems is also creating space for some of those beneficials. The uh, grain systems in particular, because they are allowed to flower, um, provide a lot of uh, pollen, uh, which can be a resource for beneficial insects as well. Um, one of my colleagues, uh, Chris Stefanzo, an entomologist at MSU, has done some great work on aphids uh, related to uh, hemp and cannabis um, in in the region here, and you can see this publication that I've cited and uh, check that out. Uh, um, we see uh, a decent amount of defoliation. It really seems that uh, this plant can handle quite a bit of defoliation. It's really the economic portions uh, that we're concerned about or anything, of course, that's going to terminate the plant or, or terminate the flowers. Um, the challenge here is that we really only have bioinsecticides and, and uh, uh, minimum risk exempt type products that are labeled for hemp uh, by the EPA currently in the US. So our conventional insecticides are, are largely unavailable. Uh, pathogens are another topic. Um, hemp is susceptible to many different pathogens. Um, again, we only have biofungicide and exempt products uh, that are labeled uh, for disease control in this crop, which is a challenge. Um, for those of you that work across cannabis uh, and also touch the marijuana space, it's been interesting that in, in many cases, we actually have more pest management tools or, or chemical options certainly available in marijuana than we do in hemp, uh, which has been a little bit challenging and, and interesting when we're in a state like Michigan that um, has both uh, marijuana and hemp uh, production happening. These are some photos of uh, pest and disease issues that we've seen. Uh, so white mold, uh, sclerotinia sclerotium, has been observed in uh, grain and CBD. These pictures are from CBD, where we've had both flower and basal stem infections. Um, and in some cases, we have branch or whole plant lodging related to those stem infections. Um, we've also seen flower infections in grain hemp with uh, sclerotinia. And it's been interesting um, to see that does certain uh, seem to kill plants, uh, uh, terminate flowers, reduce yield potential. I, I don't know though, um, you can see some sclerotia on the CBD plant on the far left, the little black dots. In general, I'm having a hard time finding sclerotia uh, from white mold infected plants. And so I wonder how good of a host um, if, if uh, the white mold is actually, you know, completing its life cycle and shedding sclerotia back into the soil. Um, <clears throat> cannabis aphid, other aphids uh, have presented themselves, uh, just depends on the year, not every year. Um, we haven't had to treat though, despite infections that, you know, look as bad as this picture, um, lady beetles have done an amazing job uh, cleaning up aphids in hemp and we haven't seen uh, real dramatic yield increase or decreases as a result.
Um, another pest that has shown up is European corn borer. We've had it in grain and CBD hemp. In the CBD, a large stemmed, highly branched plant, it almost seemed inconsequential. Um, however, in grain, we found that it could actually cause lodging in plants or terminate the plants above the point at which the uh, the borer goes in. And this picture of a flower here, you can see the frass at the base of the flower. The flower is actually terminated above the entry point there. And uh, similarly, uh, lower down the stem, we've had stem, you know, uh, stem or whole plant lodging and plants actually killed by, uh, by borers. Um, I mentioned burn damage. Bird damage has probably been our most significant pest problem uh, affecting yield quite dramatically in uh, grain hemp. Um, we've used some different tools to address that. Uh, we've also seen a lot of beneficials, as I mentioned. Leaf hopper has been uh, observed in CBD, but um, not uh, a large negative impact thus far. Um, this has been our favorite tool for controlling bird damage in not just hemp, but uh, many other crops on our farm. Uh, this is called the air dancer or a tube man. And um, this was actually uh, piloted by Cornell University. They tested the air dancer in uh, sweet corn to protect that crop from bird damage. They had great results in sweet corn and we've seen similar uh, efficacy in hemp and other crops. So I would highly recommend checking that out if you're uh, losing crops to birds particularly birds that fly into the field rather than walk in. Um, we've also seen powdery mildew and rust, uh, but uh, fairly minor. Um, in particularly cannabinoid hemp, botrytis has been an issue. Uh, uh, growers refer to this often as bud rot. It's gray mold. Um, it seems to be late in the season in a, in a wet climate like we have in the Great Lakes, uh, upper Midwest. We do get quite a bit of botrytis in uh, dense CBD hemp buds toward the end of the year. And um, we are embarking on a new project with a graduate student at Northern Michigan University who's looking at some endophytic bacteria as potential biocontrols for both botrytis and white mold. So we're excited. Um, and there are a number of biological products, uh, biological fungicides that are already labeled for use in hemp in the United States. Um, and EPA maintains that list. You can, you can Google that very easily to see what kind of pesticides are available. In terms of weeds, uh, we have a few herbicides currently labeled for hemp. We just got a label for Sonalan as a pre-emergent herbicide. Uh, folks on the conventional side are very excited about that opportunity uh, to use a pre-emergent product that will have some control of both grass, grasses and broadleaves. Um, and then we do have acetic acid as a non-selective post that is also available. Um, but the main point here is that really uh, up till this point of, of having the Sonalan label available, we were, we were looking at basically organic approaches to weed management. So starting clean, uh, knowing your weeds, you know, having the right cultivation tools and so forth available. Um, uh, but we're starting to see more, uh, more chemical options available as well. Um, so we did a, a little study as part of the hemp trim project, looking at a few different options for weed control. Um, and we compared uh, untreated control with interseeded white clover, a tine harrow, and herbicide. Uh, and this is a combination of a grass herbicide, Assure 2 and Bucktril or Bermoxanil. Uh, Assure is grass, Bucktril is broad leaves. And we did weed counts and plant counts pre and post. Um, I'm going to see if this video will play. It would be great if it did. Yeah, so this, I'll just let it play. So I hope you could see that. That was a tine harrow, and that's the cultivation tool that we use. It's a blind cultivation tool, so it's it's going over the plants uh, that are already established. It functions uh, based on a size difference uh, between plants, the crop plants, and weeds, um, and adjusting the tension on those uh, those tines to pull out the weeds and not the crop. If you ever tried a tine harrow, if you know anything about them, they're one of the most sort of variable uh, cultivation tools that are out there. It's really all about again the the weed versus the crop size and um, and then how that hair was adjusted or set up. <clears throat> um, oops. No oh boy. Okay. Um, so this is broadleaf weed counts. Um, 
looking at these different treatments pre and post. Um, so you can see that not a lot of differences. Uh, we did see some reduction in broadleaf weeds with the cultivator. The herbicide data here is actually a little bit deceiving because we got great control of some broadleaf weeds like lamb's quarter and pigweed, some of the common ones. But we had, I think it was white campion that was also in this field that was not controlled by bromoxynil. And so um, that kind of filled the gaps uh, that we cleared by removing the um, the lamb's quarters and pigweed and the like with the herbicide. And so we didn't see a lot of difference in uh, broadleaf weeds, even with the herbicide treatment, the cultivator did a bit better. Uh, in terms of grass weeds, the Assure 2 uh, is an excellent product, has very high crop safety. I, I've heard that there's maybe a label coming. I think it's going through our, our um, sort of screening program. Uh, the, um, let's, uh, skipping my mind right now, but um, it is being, sure too is being tested. So I expect that a label will be available soon in the United States. Um, but we did reduce both uh, uh, grass weeds with both the cultivator and the herbicide treatment, uh, the herbicide being the most effective in this case. Lastly, we looked at hemp stand counts um, and the challenge here, as you can see, is that both the cultivator and the herbicide uh, reduced the um, hemp stand quite significantly and really to a point that is a, a bit below our target population of 15 plants per square foot. Um, and so uh, probably leading to yield reductions um, as a result. Um, so the cultivator, you know, you're physically damaging, uh, removing hemp plants. The herbicide, uh, bromoxynil, is um, really tolerated well by some hemp cultivars and not others. And so that uh, can be a challenge. And we've collected some data um, on that issue here. As you can see, um, hemp cultivars have exhibited variable tolerance to herbicides. Really here, what's causing the injury is the, the bromoxynil, the buctril. So we've rated that um, on a visual scale of zero to five. Some general findings, um, the grain hemp material uh, coming out of Canada and the United States primarily, um, but some European varieties as well, has generally tolerated uh, bromoxynil better than the fiber material coming out of, of Europe. Um, my guess is that probably uh, some of, particularly the Canadian stuff and maybe some of the US um, uh, varieties have been selected for uh, bromoxynil tolerance, either intentionally or unintentionally, um, whereas the fiber material has not, uh, according to some of our European suppliers that have um, given us access to some of the fiber cultivars, in general, they're not treated with herbicide. They're planted very densely um, and are competing, out competing weeds uh, that way rather than being chemically controlled. Um, we did look at uh, yield by herbicide injury and uh, the herbicide injury that we caused did decrease fiber yields. So that was a concern. On the other hand, it seemed to have either no effect or maybe actually a slight increase um, on grain yields. Um, and that might have been a, a function of um, the uh, stand densities that we started with, and maybe we actually got the population a little bit closer where it needed to be. Or in other cases, we see interesting kind of regrowth patterns after herbicide injury that could have uh, adjusted yields as well. I wanted to present kind of our overall results uh, in general terms um, across uh, what the hemp trim project that we've been focused on for the last several years in Michigan here. Um, so in terms of CBD, we've had seven site years in Michigan. We've tested 67 different cultivars. Uh, CBD has varied from 3% to almost 15% in compliant cultivars, meaning they're less than 0.3% THC. And biomass has been highly variable, averaging 1.64 pounds. Uh, we have had plants that uh, are up to three and a half um, pounds of dry biomass. Per plant. Um, grain, we've had six site years of data, 25 different cultivars. You can see the range of yields there averaging about 671 pounds per acre. And uh, fiber, we've had less uh, site years where we really have just gotten into fiber in the last few years um, and eight cultivars and uh, averaging about 5,500 pounds of redded dry matter. Um, the yields are higher, green right out of the field. Um, and then we do have some mass loss in the redding process as well.
Uh, these images are just to show you kind of how we lay out our work. So in at the university locations, these all are small plots. So this is an example of what the grain and fiber trials look like. Um, we started out in the early years hand harvesting. So we would cut like meter square quadrats out of the plot and separate the material out and hand, hand thresh or use small equipment to thresh and, and process that way. And then we would retin these bundles. Um, we have moved on to combining uh, with a plot combine our grain varieties. Um, however, we're still hand cutting and hand weighing the fiber material, excuse me, in most cases. And this is a little jarry sickle bar mower that we use for that purpose. Um, I won't go through all of these results, but I just want to give you a sense of the type of data that we're collecting. So this is one of our fiber locations uh, from 2021 at Hyde, Michigan. Um, so we're spending quite a bit of time, again, uh, evaluating seed quality in terms of seed size, uh, germ and vigor, and then adjusting our seeding rates accordingly. Uh, we're looking a lot at sta stand establishment because that has been uh, pretty difficult for us um, to achieve really high rates of establishment and low mortality. Um, I talked a bit about the herbicide injury, uh, flowering dates in terms of tracking maturities, uh, cannabinoid development, and, and uh, planning our harvest dates has been very important. Um, and then we're looking at yields in terms of unredded and redded dry matter, and then trying to dig in a little bit to like bass versus herd yields or fiber quality by looking at things like stem diameter. Um, uh, Research scale um, decortication capacity has been really limited among our research partners here in the Midwest. Um, and so we really want to move further along with that and be able to actually decorticate, measure uh, bast and herd yield separately, and dig further into fiber quality uh, metrics as we move forward with this work. And then, of course, uh, looking at uh, cannabinoids for compliance, in particular for the fiber material. Uh, grain, we're doing very similar uh, evaluations here, um, and you can see some of the varieties that we've been uh, working with. Uh, we did rate white mold, as I mentioned, uh, sclerotinia has been one of our, our uh, pest problems in uh, grain hemp in particular, um, so you can see some of the numbers there. Um, this is a look at uh, grain hemp flowering uh, here in Michigan. Um, this is uh, day of year. Um, you can see that we have quite a range of flowering. Um, we have some very early grain material, including some day neutral grain material that we've been testing, like uh, maize auto is an example of that. Um, so there is a, a large range. Um, in general, some of the Canadian material and the day neutral uh, grain varieties are the early uh, flowering stuff that would be represented down at the bottom. Then the bulk of the material is flowering around, you know, day 200 or two to 210. And then we do have some uh, grain varieties that are uh, actually especially late. Um, and we're not only interested in when they flower, but how compact that flowering period is, how consistent um, uh, those individual plants are within a, a cultivar. And that consistency has been much greater on the grain and fiber side as the genetics are, are more developed than it has been um, on the cannabinoid side. This is fiber flowering day of year. Uh, some general points here is that in uh, the fiber material is usually flowering later than the grain material. Um, we're also seeing a little bit wider spread in flower dates um, within cultivars um, uh, across our applications. Um, so that's been interesting to note. Um, and the other thing with fiber is that, you know, um, the harvest date for fiber is a bit more flexible. So you see people harvesting fiber hemp anywhere from, you know, pre-flowering all the way through maybe sort of immature seed or, or late flowering timing. Um, there's different reasons for that, whether you're trying to maximize uh, fiber quality or just biomass yield, like for herd type products. Um, uh, but uh, we have more flexibility in harvest state um, for fiber which I think also will translate into some flexibility for uh, planting dates. And one of the studies that we have for our new uh, NIFA funded effort is a plant date study for grain and fiber. And we're excited to see if we can push plant dates a little bit later for fiber or investigate things like potential double crops of hemp, maybe double crop uh, fiber, or maybe uh, early grain variety followed by fiber or, or uh, some type of system like that. 
Uh, takeaways on grain and fiber, most of the varieties that we've tested have been THC compliant. There's been a few exceptions. Some of those exceptions were cultivars that were designed uh, as dual crops for both uh, grain and cannabinoids or grain fiber and cannabinoids. So they were shooting for higher cannabinoid levels. Um, also, you know, sample size matters. Um, sample size matters uh, in terms of the individual uh, subsamples that we're collecting. We've seen some changes in the final rule uh, from the interim final rule in the U.S. in terms of the length of clipping that we're taking. So we used to be taking, you know, three, four, uh, five inch clippings. Now we're taking four to eight inch clippings for sampling. So we're seeing uh, some dilution uh, with stem material, seed in some cases. Um, and so uh, sample size matters there. The other thing is uh, in terms of, you know, across our replications or locations that we're running, you may have an individual plot uh, or individual sample test above the threshold. But uh, on average, those uh, grain and fiber varieties are still compliant. So, um, and of course, timing matters uh, just as it does in, in cannabinoid uh, production. Um, when you collect that sample, how developed those flowers are is going to matter. And you have that same 30 day harvest window for grain and fiber as you do um, for cannabinoids. Um, now, we do have some opportunities for compliance based sampling on a state by state basis. The, the USDA final rule allows for that. Um, so, it's been nice that uh, in some cases grain and fiber varieties are being treated differently in terms of how they're how they're sam uh, sampled or how frequently they have to be sampled. Uh, we have seen a lot of differences among varieties here in fiber yields and grain yields and maturities um, and all that data is available through the database. In terms of uh, cannabinoids, this is what our cannabinoid trials have looked like. So they've been, again, in that horticultural model on plastic mulch, wide spacings. So we're growing from feminized seed and then uh, air drying in barns and um, stripping that biomass off of the stems and measuring that material. Uh, this is an example of um, the bucking machine that we have rented uh, uh, Capital Creations is a, a small manufacturing company, farm-based company in Michigan, and they built this machine that's basically like a glorified chicken plucker uh, to strip our plants for the research. Um, our cannabinoid data looks quite similar to what we've seen on uh, grain and fiber. We're spending a lot more time um, looking at uh, flowering dates and maturity, and then we're also doing time course sampling uh, because uh, the CBD hemp has a greater risk of going over the THC threshold because we're trying to maximize uh, cannabinoid production uh, because CBD is the product. Um, we're sampling these at three, five, and seven weeks post flower to develop that time course data. And as you can see, this was uh, based on the week five data. Very few cultivars uh, remain compliant even at five weeks after um, flower is initiated. So we're really trying to encourage folks to test and harvest early to avoid uh, non-compliance. This is what flowering has uh, looked like uh, in 2021, I believe, uh, for our cannabinoid cultivars. A few things I'll point out. We have more uh, day-neutral cultivars on the cannabinoid side than we do on grain and fiber, and that's these uh, dots on the far left. And then the other issue is that we see a much greater uh, in cultivar uh, variability that um, we see this wide range of flowering windows. So we're really talking about uh, multiple phenotypes that are, are showing up in these um, cannabinoid cultivars that just haven't been exposed to the same level of breeding uh, and selection pressure because they're newer. Um, we are seeing those tighten up as we move, move along, uh, but it has been a real challenge of uh, multiple distinct phenotypes, very long flowering windows um, and, and issues related to that. Um, when you look across the Midwest, uh, this was some data that my uh, collaborator, Phil Alberti, put together. He was looking at um, the flowering dates by hardiness zone across our region. It was really interesting to see that we're looking at about a 7.9 day window uh, of flowering from the, the coldest to the warmest hardiness zones. Um, now, in the Midwest, you not only have the latitudinal effect of hardiness, but you also have the Great Lakes. Uh, so nearness to shore is a factor um, in this picture as well. But it's been interesting to see how that tracks across the region. 
This is uh, THC development. I mentioned the time course sampling that we're doing. So this is THC uh, across weeks of flowering. So you can see at uh, three weeks, uh, almost all the cultivars or all the cultivars in this case were compliant under 0.3. When we get to five weeks, uh, a number of them start to get above that threshold. And at seven weeks, even more of them are above the threshold. Um, so the ones that are Usually not. If you look at the bottom, the dotted lines there are CBG cultivars that uh, are are low to no THC in many cases. Um, but uh, yeah, once you get into five to seven weeks of flowering, it's very hard to uh, maintain compliance. And then when we look at CBD to THC ratios, what we find is that it's been very difficult in general to get about over about 8% CBD while remaining under the THC threshold. There are examples of you know, plants up to uh, 14, 15% uh, CBD while remaining compliant, but most of the uh, cultivars that we see can't get over about 8%. So for the the processors, um, that's a challenge. You know, they would like higher concentration material, but that's the reality of what we're seeing. Um, so that I think is an appropriate production target for growers is about 8% CBD concentration to, to remain compliant. CBD takeaways, again, it's been hard to maintain compliance uh, as we go later uh, into the flowering period. Um, CBG and zero THC cultivars are, we're all compliant. I think they're going to be a great tool for growers moving forward that are focused on non-THC cannabinoids. So testing and harvesting early is definitely the, the biggest message. Um, we've been looking at CBD to THC ratio as kind of a way to rate cultivars. And you can see some of the ones that have been highest in that regard. And then uh, cultivars that are high yielding for biomass as well. Um, the Midwestern Hemp Database uh, is where all of our data uh, from these trials is going. There's a cannabinoid hemp database that was the original product, and then we've more recently developed the fiber uh, and grain hemp database uh, to go alongside that. Um, it is hosted by University of Illinois Extension. Uh, we've had 200 plus growers submit uh, data as well as flower samples to our partner labs for, for testing. And uh, that's been over 2000 samples that have gone into the uh, database. Um, it's been a great partnership. It's becoming one of the, the greatest sources of uh, hemp variety performance information from the U.S. and, and certainly for our region. Um, and it's allowing us as researchers to develop standardized protocols for research and variety assessment. It's a, It's been the repository of the information that we're generating. Um, and then also uh, we're starting to see regulators get interested in using it as a tool for performance-based testing because we actually have a data set that they can, uh, according to the final rule, they have to have 95% confidence that, um, that a variety is not gonna go over the threshold based on previous data to opt out of, of sampling and testing that variety. And now we have a tool to, to facilitate that. Um, we also have hemp resources available direct from MSU. Aside from the database, uh, we have a hemp web page. We have our uh, individual site uh, web page, the Upper Peninsula Research and Extension Center, where you can find reports on all of this research. And I uh, just want to wrap up with acknowledging all my collaborators. Uh, apologies if I missed anybody, but uh, it's been a wild ride since 2019 with hemp uh, here in the Midwest US. Uh, and we're excited to continue uh, working with all of these folks and generating information that's hopefully useful to growers and, and others to move this industry forward. So um, I apologize, I went a little bit over. I'm happy to stick around as long as we need to, to answer questions. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Bidecker, for a really wonderful and um, full of information talk that gave us, you know, in-depth information as well as overview of the situation. This has been very interesting. We have uh, lots of questions, and we'll try to go you know, through as many as uh, as we can. Um, one of the question is is that uh, you mentioned that uh, seed vigor is improving, that you've seen improvement in seed vigor. And do you think that this is uh, related to changes in genetics, so in the germplasm that you're receiving, or this is improvement in the seed production uh, methods? 
Great question. So I think both are happening simultaneously. So we have breeders and seed suppliers that are gaining more experience with this crop. Um, their techniques are improving. And as a result, the actual germplasm is improving. Um, I mentioned the challenges with stand establishment. One of the um, innovations that we're very excited to see happening in the industry is hybrids. So uh, last year we had one hybrid that we got our hands on and got to grow. This year, I think we have five hybrids from two different suppliers. And uh, uh, one of the things aside from the basic you know yield differences uh, that they're seeing is they're talking about actually much better stand establishment and so i think uh, seed quality seedling vigor uh, and just consistency in those seed lots uh, within varieties is improving so so i think it's it's both We're, the the players are gaining experience and and as a result the actual uh, material plant material is improving at the same time yeah, the entire industry is developing on all levels, basically. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the seed establishment. We have another question about seed establishment. Um, you mentioned that there are challenges in seed establishment. Um, are you planning any uh, any studies related to trying to improve issues with this? And if yes, do you already have plans for the other to hear? Yeah, so actually this season we are initiating uh, some trials under the... Uh, NIFA Supplemental and Alternative Crops Program are, are collaborative. And uh, the one focus on establishment is a tillage by seeding rate study. So we'll be comparing uh, no-till with the tilled uh, seedbed preparation, and then looking at that across, um, I think, three or four different seeding rates. Um, so, and, and that includes uh, two grain varieties and two fiber varieties. So yes, we are starting to look at this issue. I'm very excited to see um, what the uh, early results of that look like. Um, we, we have really struggled with this issue, um, and we've kind of gone to the, the nth degree in terms of very intensive tillage, uh, packing the soil, pre-planting to control depth and improve seed soil contact and so forth. And we've had some unintended consequences uh, related to that compaction, related to um, uh, nutrient loss, I think, because of that compacted soil and limited root development, that these things that we're trying to do to improve stand establishment um, ha have had other unintended and unintended issues have, have resulted. So um, ideally we would be able to implement no-till in this crop like we have for other uh, commodities in the United States, other oil seeds like soybeans, for example. Um, but I think we've got a long ways to go to, to make that happen successfully and, and consistently. Yeah, a long way to go in many areas of cannabis cultivation. <laughs> um, you mentioned that in the cannabinoid, the uh, producing lines. I mean, their uh, maturation is tend to be later than for the seed producing. Um, the, the question is: Are there any? Are you aware of any breeding efforts which are done for early CBD lines for the Midwest? So, sorry, would you repeat so, that? Sorry. Yes. Are you aware if there are any uh, breeding efforts? which are conducted for a early CVD lines with suitable for the Midwest. Is there any breeding done? Yes. Yep. So there are some companies that are targeting these uh, geographies and early maturing varieties in particular. Um, if you look at our reports, or you may have noticed uh, some of the, the variety names are indications. So early Nueve, for example, um, and other varieties that have that early uh, moniker in their in their variety name. Um, and, and those have been quite successful for us. They are maturing earlier um, and we're be able, able to harvest them when conditions are ideal without running into disease problems and the like late in the season. The difficulty there uh, with the early maturing stuff is just staying on top of cannabinoid development and making sure that uh, we stay compliant um, at, at the point of, of regulatory testing and, and hopefully through harvest as well. So, uh, but yes, there are companies that are working on it. Um, there's also the day neutral material that is very early um, flowering independent of, of day length at something like uh, Let's see, we're spending two weeks in the greenhouse and then, uh, you know, they're flowering at something like uh, like four to six weeks from from seeding. So they're, they're very, very early. Uh, the yields per plant on the day neutral material are much lower as a result. So we're talking about, you know, a plant that produces at best maybe half a pound versus, you know, three or three and a half pounds. Um, but what people are doing is planting them much more densely, sometimes direct seeding them. And as a result, uh, 
some of the preliminary work suggests that actually the per acre biomass yields of the day neutral material could be uh, at least competitive, if not higher than um, than the photoperiod sensitive uh, cannabinoid hemp. So that's exciting to think about too, in terms of earliness. Is there a considerable amount of commercial uh, day neutral uh, grow? No, no, not at all. I mean, not at all. Um, so I, I wanted to, I kind of ran out of space and time, but um, one of the things I wanted to know is that early on in uh, hemp commercialization, so 2019, 20, we saw massive interest in hemp cultivation almost exclusively for cannabinoids for CBD in the Midwest US and really all over the United States. So everybody jumped in two feet first, uh, and almost all of it was for CBD because they saw profit potential. Very quickly, we saw a waning demand and oversupply of, of CBD hemp in the United States, and that market has pretty well collapsed. So now we've seen a drastic reduction in the number of growers that are getting licensed and the number of acres that are being planted in the Midwest US. Um, those acres and growers that are participating are almost exclusively now growing for grain and fiber with the primary focus being on fiber. And I always found it kind of interesting. Um, I would have assumed in 2018, 19, that grain would be the easy point of entry. That's been Canada's focus since the mid 1990s. They've done it quite successfully. Um, the animal feed market is a huge opportunity, although there's regulatory barriers against that in the US. Um, but for whatever reason, we as Americans are maybe too uh, independent or whatever, but uh, we went CBD and now we're going fiber and kind of have you know uh, sidestepped the what seems like the odd obvious, easier point of entry. Um, but uh, we are way down in growers and acres. Uh, for example, in Michigan, we went from something like 350 uh, licensed growers in 2020 to I think there's uh, less than 50 uh, licenses in the state this year. So yeah. the general trend, unfortunately. Um, um, do you have a, do you know if there is any use of uh, mycorrhizae in, in soil to increase the, the growth and development? Is it a common practice or only on trial on a trial basis? Um, use, it's a good the, question. The use of mycorrhizae. Yeah, I I have not heard uh, much about it. Um, I what, what's interesting about this crop, uh, cannabis in general, hemp in particular, is that due to prohibition, uh, the knowledge base and the expertise that we have available is uh, incredibly informal and incredibly uh, dispersed, right? And so um, it, the, the hemp community is very interesting. It is not our standard uh, agriculture community by any means. And so um, there's lots of interest in topics like this, biological products, organic production, um, and, and other things that um, may be seen as, uh, uh, you know, not, not conventional anyway. Um, so I know there's a lot of interest out there. Um, one of our collaborators is Northern Michigan University. Um, they have a, a medicinal plant chemistry program and they have a lot of students that are interested in biological products. Um, I mentioned the uh, endophytic bacteria for uh, fungal disease control project that we're embarking on with them. Um, so that would be an example of people that are working in that area. Um, uh, another kind of related topic is phytoremediation with hemp. A uh, number of uh, folks in the region and collaborators looking at phytoremediation of, of metals, of PFAS, uh, chemicals using cannabis, uh, using hemp to uptake those. And I'm sure that that um, uh, synergy with biology like my, mycorrhizae, if mycorrhizae associations can facilitate uh, uptake of contaminants and so forth, uh, there's going to be a lot of work in that space. Thank you. Um, one more question. I mean, this is a question. It's a very compound question. Part of it you mentioned throughout your talk. But the question is, are you using crop rotation, intercrop systems, and natural mulching? And if so, which ones and what type of crops are you trying? So you talked yeah, a so, about crop rotation. 
Yeah, it's an important question. Um, we haven't dug into this nearly enough. A couple of kind of anecdotal observations. Um, we have seen directly and also heard from collaborators about the challenge of following small grains with hemp. Um, the, the reasons why hemp has suffered uh, following small grains like uh, oats and barley, uh, rye, for example, um, is is interesting. We, we, I guess I don't know the explanation, but uh, that has been observed. So that's a rotation question that we certainly need to, to look into. Um, in many cases, the, the sites and the collaborators that we've had, we're following uh, sod in many cases. And that rotation uh, can be challenging for any crop, but in particular, uh, grass weeds uh, have been difficult when we take an organic approach when we're not using herbicides, grass weed pressure has been very detrimental to hemp. Whereas it seems that broad leaves, uh, hemp can compete a little bit better with, but grasses have been, been challenging. Um, other rotation things. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's the bulk of it. Um, we're hoping to draw on our grower collaborators over the next few years to look at what their rotations entail and, and how that might be influencing hemp. Um, but we don't, for example, have like a long-term rotation experiment or anything that we're implementing. Um, so I'd love to love to learn more about that personally. Wonderful. You received the message as we are running out of time. There's so many interesting questions. So just ask one last question. And thank you for your patience for answering all those interesting questions. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, someone would love to hear your take on CRISPR work being done to create either pest management resistant or THC free hemp or whatever uh, in cannabis seeds. Uh, there is a company which is licensed to do CRISPR for this, which is now producing in San Francisco. They're curious on if you have any thoughts on the use or implementation or thoughts on this. Yeah, it's a really good question. So personally, I think that this does have a place in the industry. Um, and I, th I think there's two ways that you could approach this, right? One way to, would be cannabis liberalization. So we're going to liberalize uh, cannabis. We're going to stop regulating THC as a drug and not be so concerned about how much THC is in these products. That's one strategy. And I think that probably will occur at some level in the United States. However, what we're starting to see, I think, is that consumers in some cases are, are concerned about THC. So for example, if we're going to get approvals to use hemp as feed ingredients for livestock, I think it's going to be pretty important to show that we don't have uh, THC in those animal products that are being utilized for food, because that's a consumer sector or group of consumers that in most cases, they just want, you know, healthy animal products for food. They're not looking for some sort of cannabinoid enhanced product necessarily. They just want healthy meat, eggs, dairy, et cetera. And so um, if we can, go into that uh, with a zero THC or TH free, THC free hemp products to feed to those animals and just sidestep the whole conversation about the fate of those cannabinoids in, in livestock and livestock products, um, then I think uh, we'll be in a much easier place for getting those uh, feed ingredient approvals, for example. So, so I think it's both. I think, I think uh, personally, I would love to not be concerned about uh, THC regulation, either because my cultivar is THC free or because the federal government tells me I don't have to be concerned about it. Wonderful. Since I'm receiving messages that you know, we're running out of time, there's still interesting questions. And some of the actually participants ask if you're willing to share again the first slide that has your email on it. So I'm not sure yes, if you're- bear with me. Email, but there's, a lot of, there's a lot of interest, it's a good sign. So yeah, again, that's great. I would yeah, like, that's great. Yeah. Yes, interest is always good. So again, I would like to thank you very much you know, for a very interesting presentation and patients a very thorough answer to the question. And it was a pleasure. And I want to thank, you know, all the participants, you know, from nearby and far away, wherever you are, for participating. And also to remind you that uh, within a day or two, a recording of the webinars will be online. It will be online. So thank you again very much and have a wonderful day or a wonderful evening or good night, whatever. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks.